So ideally, we would have an entire class period to go through this PowerPoint. If we get stuck, if we get to the point where you get a syntax error, if you're following along and either one of us can spot it quickly, we may just have to throw our hands up and keep going. So what is JavaScript? It's what makes web pages interactive. Your pull-down menus, your things that change in size, anything that can redraw the web page without the web page going back and doing the spinning circle and hitting the web server for a new web page. It's designed to avoid doing that. The JavaScript runs in the client software and it's delivered to your client in the form of a text file. What do we mean client? Well, it's just the browser. This is our browser. Ultimately, HTML is just a web file. If we view the page source, we're going to see you know, all sorts of text, and then there'll be some links to some JavaScript files as well. Right? Animations.js, config.js. Who knows what all this stuff is, but uh, it's just text. And then just like the Python client, the Python uh, shell runs Python, then the browser runs the JavaScript in order to manipulate the document, the uh, elements that it's seeing, the so-called document object model, the DOM, that the browser builds in its memory and then displays on screen. So the goal of JavaScript is to replace the server-side scripting. Server-side scripting, you know, you could make a web page and it could send it to us and maybe it has the table already pre-filled in and then you click a button and it selects something, you know, and ask for another web page. JavaScript could uh, have it so that if you select the item on the web page, it'll go ahead and add it to your cart and then contact the database behind the scenes without having to do a refresh. So it enables shopping carts, form validation, you're typing along and uh, you type in an invalid zip code, it complains right away instead of waiting until you click the... Uh, you know, the send button. Graphic and text effects, image swapping, image mapping, clocks, and more. JavaScript is definitely case sensitive. HTML is not, although you ought to follow the you know lowercase rule for HTML and not make your tags uppercase. The uh, clients are forgiving and will go ahead and allow that to work. So uses the dot syntax, just kind of like we've seen before. Document dot write, hello world. Simple text, it's ASCII text. To know about it, we have to talk about objects, properties, methods, events, functions, values, variables, expressions, and operators. Well, thankfully, we know that the vast majority of these things are operator, plus, minus, multiplication, that kind of thing. Expression, A plus B divided by C. If a less than seven, a less than seven is an, a Boolean expression. Variables, we certainly know what variables are. Values, three, right? That's a value. Functions, we've been writing functions. Events, well, we started playing with events at the end when we were doing our graphical user interfaces. We'd attach a function name to a button, and then you'd click the button, and it would invoke that function. We didn't invoke the function, the user did by clicking the button and then the user interface generated an event which, call, which called our function. A method is just a function that's attached to a piece of data, like turtle.forward.forward, or you're doing string.replace because you want to replace all the A's in your string with B's, that dot replace is a method that's attached to the string before it. A property is a variable that's attached to a class, to an object. We played with that a little bit as well. And then what is an object? It's an instance of a class. You create a car, the car is your object, and then the class was whatever defined it. You create a turtle, the turtle is the object of the turtle class. So an object, in this case, a window, a document, an image, a table, a form, a button, a link. Your objects should be named and they have properties that act as modifiers. So when you name them, when you name an object property, you give the object's name followed by a period and the property name. Document.bg color. Document is the object, bg color is the property. If it had parentheses after it, if it looked like a function, it'd be a method. 
It doesn't, so it's a property. Other programming disciplines like C++ and Java would call that a instance variable. So methods are actions that apply to a particular object. In other words, it's a function that's attached to an object. Again, document is the object and write is the method. What is an event? It associates an object with an action. You can make it an on mouse over event handler so that when the mouse, the cursor moves over the button, it changes colors. So we have to register an on mouse over event handler for that to happen. Or we register an on submit handler so that if they click a button that's supposed to submit the form, we call our code instead of just going out to the server and letting them load something new. And the users trigger those events. Their actions trigger their events. They move the cursor over the button and it changes color or changes its image or they click the submit button. And so the on submit event handler is invoked. We know what a function is. It's a name statement that performs tasks. This language, you use the word function instead of DEF, and you give it a name. Inside the parentheses, you might list some variables, you might not, and in between the curly braces, rather than indenting, we put our code. And then values. One, two, three, strings. The words true or false, which in this case are not capitalized. Python's the only one that I've seen that uses true and false with initial caps. An expression. Month is equal to May. Well, May is an expression. Expressions use an assignment operator to calculate the result of that and store it in there. Well, that's a pretty simple expression. It used to usually be like 1 plus 2 or some form of calculation or function call that would evaluate something and then return it. Operators, arithmetic, equal signs, right, and and or things like that. So JavaScripts can reside in a separate page or they could be included right in your HTML, embedded in the HTML. We played with uh, embedding our JavaScript right in the body of our document. You can also store them as functions right in the head. We will get to this pretty soon. If you're going to embed functions from another document into your HTML, you use the SR, the source tag. I have a script. Here's its source. Give it a file name. Language is equal to JavaScript 1.2. Oddly enough, if you leave that entirely off, it still works. And the type is equal to text slash JavaScript. Comments. Just like every other language has some way of marking off text as being a comment and not being processed by the computer. Angle, exclamation mark, minus, minus, begins it, and minus, minus, greater than, ends it. That's the HTML comment. However, the JavaScript comment is slash slash, which you'll see in a lot of languages like C, C++, and Java. Kind of confusing that there's two different kinds of comments, but that's because JavaScript was invented way, way later than HTML. So this is on the HTML side and then inside the code, inside the scripts, you just use slash slash like we use our uh, hashtags, like we use our pound signs. I'm going to get to some of the good stuff. <coughs> All right, if you go to uh, this PowerPoint, you might even be able to copy and paste this stuff rather than typing it in. You just go to uh, our page, content, JavaScript notes, JavaScript PowerPoints, and get the last document. I may type it in anyways, but I don't want to spend too much time doing that, so I may also be tempted to copy and paste. I'm going to open up TextPad. So I'm going to go to the start box, type in TextPad, and I need a starting document. So I'm going to make a HTML tag, a head tag, I'm going to give it a title, 
I'm going to give it a pair of script tags. I'm going to close my head tag. I'm going to create a body and close my body and close the HTML. Feel free to highlight that and paste it. HTML, head, title equals, quote, my title, my web page. I've done that wrong. It's not an attribute. Then I'm going to make a script tag where we might insert scripts later. We don't have any scripts right now, so I'm going to close it. I'm going to close my head header tag. And I'm going to close my HTML tag. Thanks. So this will be Z. Make sure you save it as HTML and not dot text. Yeah, slash title, slash title, like that. We can tab it over a little bit more like that if we want. All right, that's not much of a web page, but it's going to have a title. Control S to save, plan it to launch it, and we can see that it's got a title, my web page. I didn't add the body, so I'm going to come down here and add the body. Body. Hello. Slash body. So there's our body, there's our, uh, our title. Titles don't mean so much anymore because you get so many tabs open that you can't read them. Or I could have gone in here, highlighted all that text from inside the PowerPoint if you downloaded the PowerPoint, copy it, paste it. I made that one change. I called it my web page. There we go. Pardon me? In the hello, you put right. The yeah, we had down here in the body something as well. So we're going to add a function. To get this to work, we're going to be relying upon the fact that you can tag each element in your document with a different ID. So for example, we're going to go and add some text to our document, but we're going to give it a specific ID. Now my HTML with that uh, hello piece of text wasn't very good. I should have enclosed it in a paragraph tag. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to here and I'm going to enclose this in a paragraph tag. Angle, P, close angle, hello, and then close that tag. But I'm going to give it an ID so that we can change it. I guess I'm going to call it demo. So, before the closing brace, ID equals quote demo. This is its lookup. This is its name. This is how we find it and do some do something to it with the button that we're going to calculate with the button that we're going to create, which is going to call a function that we add to the script. So over here in the script section, this will not be a bad one at all to copy and paste. Why? Because if we get a single thing wrong, a single letter uppercase where, rather than lowercase, but if we look at it, what is it doing? Document.getElementById, it finds that element.
based on its ID. And then it replaces its inner HTML with something else other than just whatever it says right now. It's going to say, hello, JavaScript. So please, if you free, feel free, grab that, copy it, and paste it right here. So function change demo, parentheses in parentheses, curly brace, e is equal to document dot get element by id, parentheses quote demo, e dot enter html equals hello JavaScript. And we're going to need a button that calls that when clicked. That one syntax is not so gnarly. I don't mind typing that by hand. So down here underneath our text, but still as part of the body, button, space, type equals quote button, end quote, on click equals quote, and we're going to invoke the change demo function. So change demo with that capital D to match case entirely, correctly. Change demo, parentheses in parentheses. end quote, close that tag so that we can put some text. Click me and then close our button. Yeah, if I don't have any typos, it's going to work. Oh, we're being sloppy. We're not putting semicolons after stuff that we should. I'm going to put a semicolon there, and a semicolon there, and a semicolon there. Just because the language is usually allow us to, and just because the browsers usually allow us to get away with not doing that, we're better than that. Okay, click me, and it changed it to hello JavaScript. It could do anything it wanted to to the web page. It could invoke a function that would create an entirely brand new section of the web page. It could do some database calls. It could hide sections of the web page. It could show sections of the web page. We'll do a few more things. Who needs me to look at their screen for a moment? So. This could be anything that we wanted it to be, not just the word hello script, um, hello JavaScript. <clears throat> Table TR, these are all tags, TD, test, slash TD. TD, test2, slash TD, slash TR, slash table. So table, TR, TD, some text, slash TD, which means the end of that element. TD means add another element. So we're going to have two elements side by side in our little table. Some more text, a slash TD, a slash TR, and a table. And I forgot to save it. So if I control S or click the, the disk icon and then run it, now you can't really see it. It's not specially formatted like a table, but if we right click and do view page source, we will see that actually we would have to inspect it as an element. 
inspect, we will see that it's right now a table. See? It got changed. That paragraph element, its text got changed into a table. And we just can't tell it's a table because we didn't put borders in it. I wonder if adding borders to it would be as easy as doing this. Border equals two as part of the table tag. Yep, there we go. Now we can tell it's a table. All right, so if we had some images saved, we could get the images to swap. To get this to work, we'd have to download two pictures, name them image one and image two, IMG one and IMG two. And this is going to be fraught with peril, so if you don't feel like doing it, it's okay. But I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot just because it looks nice. I'm going to go and do Google search. Droid. Okay, funny, when I started writing these things, you didn't get pictures of phones. All right, here I got a droid. Right click, save image as. I want to call it image one and put it in my programming folder. If it's not in my, my code directory, it's not going to work. IMG1.jpg. Now I'm going to click find another picture. Here we go, he's cute. Right click on him, save image as img2.jpg All right, now from your JavaScript, go ahead and grab this chunk of code. <clears throat> it's an image tag. And the source of the image is image1.jpg. But notice that it's got an on-click method as well. Buttons are the only thing that can be clicked. So when we click on the picture of the battle droid there, it's going to call the change image function. I'm not going to even copy the change image function yet. I just want to see this part work. I want to see my picture work. So I'm going to right click copy, come in here and paste it as part of the body underneath the button above the closed body tag. And assuming I have an image one.jpg tag, and if you feel like it, you can tab everything over. Code gets really sloppy if we don't. Control S to save it, click the planet, and uh, that's pretty blurry. We could change its size. I'm not going to bother. Wouldn't take that long. So where it says IMG, we're going to add a style attribute. Style equals, quote, with colon, how wide should he be? Just 100 pixels wide. That ought to be enough to prove the point, or 200. With colon, 200 px, semicolon, end quote. All right, he's looking a lot less blurry now. Now that he's 200 wide. We need to get that function that change image is going to call. For this to work unmodified, your images are going to have to have these exact names, image1.jpg and image2.jpg. So from the PowerPoint, I'm going to grab the change image function and embed it in the script section in our header. And help us, heaven help us if we have a typo in what we're copying and pasting. All right, so now I have two functions. Along with the change demo, which just changed the text, what is this one going to do? Well, this image has an ID as well. It's got the ID of droid. So when we click change image, 
an event's going to be generated which invokes this function, change image. It's going, by the way, VAR means define a variable. Oddly enough, it doesn't seem to be strictly necessary. I believe that in this language, just like in Python, you can declare variables on the fly. Good programming practice would have been to put the word VAR there, not VST. Who knows if I broke that? Don't think I did. Anyways, document get element by ID. Now we have an element. I just called it image rather than E because that's what this one's pointing to. And then if image.src.match, if the source of this tag, right, this is the tag. This is the attribute, just like this. Here's the tag, here's the attribute. We could also be accessing its style and changing its style or changing what it, what it clicks, what function it calls. Anything that we have in there, we could change. But what we're saying is if it matches this file name, then we're going to change the source of it to this file name. Else, we're going to change the back to image 1. So maybe we can see it's toggling. If it's image 1, set it to image 2. Else, set it back to image 1. Notice no colon here. If we want to, we could use curly braces. I'm going to undo this really fast. If you feel like leaving them and you're sure that your syntax is correct, then you could put braces like that. Just like we use in dents, these other languages use curly braces. They don't care a whit about tabs. Want to make your code look like that? As long as you've got semicolons in the right places, that works. Now, is that good? No, not at all. But not every language uses tabs. Far more than don't than do. The tabs are just for the humans to read it. The computer doesn't care about them. All right, now if I played my cards right, and I've got my files in the right place, and I don't have any typos, I hit the planet, I click him because he's got an on-click method registered, and there we go. He's invoking that function. An event is being generated which calls that function. He's a little bit smaller than this guy. Maybe we ought to change his width when we go to that, or change his height. I don't know how tall this guy is. 200, 400, 600, 800. Let's make the droid have a, the green one, have a height of about 800. Nah, we're going to increase his width instead. So, where it says image.source equals image2.jpg, when we're swapping him out with that one, we're going to try to change his style as well. Image style equals, maybe we just add a border around him. Border colon 1px, nah, let's make a huge border. 10px solid red in semicolon, end quote, and another semicolon. All right, now he's got his red border. Now that messed up the other style, right? It completely overwrote the style for the first droid because it went down here and when we click this and it changes image.style, it wiped out this style that we already had. The style equals width colon 200px. We could make the other one set that reset that back. So I'm going to add one more. image.style equals quote I could just copy and paste. That's faster. Right here where we have style equals width colon 200px. I guess that wasn't too much typing. So image.style equals width colon 200px. End. Excuse me. Semicolon. End quote. And another semicolon. Right. This has a semicolon because it's part of an attribute and you separate elements of a style attribute with semicolons and this ends the line of JavaScript. Control S to save, click to run, there we go. Yeah, now they're about the same height each time. 
we could add other stuff to the style, right? You know, we could give him a different color border. If we wanted to copy and paste that, change the numbers and stuff, and insert it right there. But I think that's enough to prove the point. Here we found an element, and we changed its HTML inside the element. We changed everything inside the paragraph tag. We effectively deleted the stuff that was inside the paragraph tag here and replaced it with this stuff, this table. So that's one way of changing content. Another is to find a tag and change its properties. Change its attributes. We change the source attribute there, and we change the style attribute there. Anything in there can be changed. Even the JavaScript. We could change the on click so that it called something else. Oh, no wonder he was so big. I had a width tag here as well. That's garbage because now we have conflicting. We set the width via CSS, cascading style sheet attributes, style attributes, and we also set it the old-fashioned way with an HTML tag. I would delete that. We're about to be done with this because I want to move on to the next one if we possibly have enough time to do it. But I do want to make a quick walkabout, and if you have a problem, that can be solved in a minute. All right. So it is working for me. I hope it's working for y'all. It's so easy to leave off a quote, something like that. And we can't get it all on the screen at the same time. That's why I start advocating for copying and pasting at this point. You just have to look at the code really carefully because you learn even less by copying and pasting than you do just by you know transcribing what you see on the screen. I know that some people don't learn as well much from typing as the others because, you know, a monkey can type something and if it's not seeking in, it's not good. And I found that this is a way that helps the most people to let it sink in because otherwise people start checking their phone and, you know, and browsing 4chan. I'm kidding. Do not do that here. Let's, uh...
going to do the server side python in the next 20 minutes that we have this is just a very brief introduction but I'm hoping you have the idea now if you did not before of tags attributes style tags and the way that JavaScript can be in, be invoked by triggers such as on click we could make it this instead of on click, we could make it on mouse over. And that would mean every, if I could not say that D in there, on mouse over without the D, every time I move my mouse over it, it would change. So it's just generating a different now. You would not want to make it do that, but you can make it more subtle, right? You move your mouse over something and it underlines it, right? or it highlights it, puts it in a glowy look. All right, this next stuff we want to do is in a zip file attached to a folder in our assignments. I did start the recorder, did I not? Yes. Look for folder X in class. I can just move it to where it's supposed to be. should not be called X. We had more classes this semester. That was a particularly rough semester with a lot of school days. Closed. Okay. Anyways, if you scroll down to the very bottom, very, very, very bottom, go to the next page, next page, next page if you need to, you will see a folder called X Web App. I'll rename it and call it, you know, Z2 and something like that. But you're going to want the zip file that's attached to it. Better be a zip file there. There is. WebApp1.zip and WebApp1Assignment. What this one does is it uses a Python library that will run Python as an HTML server. Now, it would be absolutely insane to try to set up a professional website this way. But for development, for development purposes, for demonstrating client-side, excuse me, server-side Python, that's okay. Now I'm going to open up the doc because it gives some instructions. Back in the old days, I would hand people documents and they would type stuff in. All right, so I need to extract this zip file for some reason, um, they've decided that these machines do not need to actually run the normal thing when you, anyways, I forget which zip this is running, but it's annoying to me. Click extract and put it somewhere you like, right? I'm going to put mine in my CIT folder. 
off the desktop. Oh, for Pete's sake. Okay, desktop, CIT, 123. It doesn't matter where you put it as long as you can find it in a minute. If you can't find it that way, go and find the zip file, show in folder, right click and do extract. Right click. I'm not even spotting it. What's wrong with my brain? Pardon me? Under open? That, I guess I would do it, but then it'll just bring this back up. Okay, all right. Anyways, if you, op if you open it and then click extract, store it somewhere where you can find it, you're all good. Then you might as well grab the doc as well. Use file open to locate simple httpd.py script. So launch idle, file open, or you could just, you know, right click on it and say open with idle. Go and find your folder where you extracted it to. And if you can't find it, you're just going to watch for a while. Sort by date modified. Don't sort by date modified. Find the web app one folder. It would have been easier just go and right click on it. Simple HTTP D.py. Open that. Better way probably would have been to find it inside and then find it and open it that way instead. Anyway, as long as you get it open, it's good. Now we're going to import HTTP server and HTTP request handler. HTTP server is the software that runs on your, on your Windows machine waiting for HTTP requests. And so it creates a server. It's going to call a request handler. And it's going to tell us starting simple HTTPD on which port. It's going to use just a standard port, standard server port. That serve forever. That just means serve until this window is closed. Run, run module. And there we go. Now we have a web server. Not going to do anything, or maybe it will. Let's load up. Is it 127001, guys? HTTP colon backslash backslash 127.0.0.1. Easier to type localhost. I should have done that. Refusing connection. Localhost. All right, now if this part's not working, then we're getting running into trouble. Connection refused. That's not what I want to see. This demo will come to a crashing halt if we can't get it. Is it working for anybody else? If you get the web server running, and then you go to Chrome and you type in localhost, no spaces, does it do anything? Maybe I better read my instructions a little bit more clearly. When you run the script, you may get a firewall message. Allow Python to run through the firewall. Oh, we set it equal to localhost colon 8080. I don't know why I set it equal to that port. My mistake. Go to your favorite web browser. Try to go to localhost colon 8080. And there we go. Welcome to the most awesome web page Beatles website ever. For now, all you'll find is a voting poll. Enjoy. All right, so this is the only clickable thing here. I click on voting poll, and it takes me here. Now we're going to go and find the code that generated that web page and then generated this. So I'm going to find my web app folder. I'm going to open it up. We see index.html. I'm going to right click on index.html and choose edit or open with text pad. Edit would probably do. Probably just open up notepad. Okay, fine. Open in Word. That was not my goal. All right. Right click, edit, open with text pad. All right. Ta da! It's just a web page.
just like we've been working on. Notice the ahref. This is what would load up if we clicked on it. It doesn't have to be a script like this. It could just be another web page, right? I could type in HTTP, don't do this, HTTP colon, colon, or excuse me, slash slash google.com. Then when I run it, when I click on vote, it takes me to Google. That's what an ahref tag does. href meaning hypertext reference. But we want it to trigger IPython script, so we're leaving that alone. CGI-bin voting.py. This is all server-side stuff. The client doesn't have Python installed on it for this to work. So let's go into CGI bin directory and take a look at what we got there. CGI bin. Oh, and it's got a couple things I need to delete from that. We don't need athlete list and athlete model anymore. Had two web pages in here at one time. What, are, what is it supposed to call? It's supposed to call voting.py. If I go into voting.py and open it with idle, or whatever our favorite editor is, there we go. This is using Yate, yet another template editor. What does it do? We've seen this syntax. It's just creating a list called band. Print. Yate.start response. That generates the HTTP tag. If we go and go back to localhost, refresh the page, click on voting poll. I didn't save it. Close that, or not close it, save it, run it click on voting poll, all of this is generated by that Python file, except it opened it as a Python script. Absolutely not what it was supposed to do. Did our Python uh, server get closed? Yeah, maybe. CGI script exited okay. It was not supposed to do that. It's okay. Just close your shell. Go back. I have a bad feeling about this. Go and find your simple HTTP D, HTTP demon, daemon, if you say it like that. All righty. Run it. Get it listening again. Now what? What did I just do? Why did it not run that? Because I clicked on Python shell rather than run module. Thank you. All right, now it's listening on port 8080 again. Come up here, localhost, colon 8080, click on it, click voting poll, and here we go. All of this is generated by that Python file. That Python file did not look at, like HTML at all. And here's what it is. This is what it looked like after Python generated it and sent it. The template editor is actually sending it. We could have just used print statements. That's all we had to do is start executing print statements. But instead, the template editor is supposed to make it a little bit easier. So if I come back here and I find my voting.py, it starts the HTML response. It creates a header called Beatles Forever. It starts a form called Vote Selected. It has some text, paragraph tag, who is the best Beatle of all time. For each name in the band, it adds a radio button. Then it ends our form, and it has an, in, an include footer. And we see all that if we're looking at our web page. It's HTML. When they click the button, it's supposed to call vote selected.py. We can go and look at vote selected now. Vote selected. Right click, edit with idle. Vote selected. Import CGI. Import CGI DB. Enable CGI DB. Import Yate. Start a new response. So when they click on that, it starts generating a new web page. Print A. That's the response. And then include the header. And then print that out. 
And then it changes the form data, which beetle accesses what they chose, the beetle that they chose as values, so that we can add that to our text file. So if they chose Ringo or whatever, then it's going to say that the beetle that they chose is Ringo. So if we go back here, we run it again. We click P. If we view the HTML, each radio button, each button that they choose has a different value. Value Paul, value Pete, value George, value John. So the CGI script comes and pulls that value out so that our Python script can manipulate it. Select. There we go. Peetle. A uh, beetle. Pete. There was no Ringo listed. Ring Pete. Best was the original drummer for the band, and they fired him and hired Ringo. All right. Right on, man. Love is all you need. Go home, which is just an ahref tag to index.html, or vote again, which takes us back to voting.py. Takes us back to the voting screen. Now, it would be fun to see if we can make any edits to this. Now, if you haven't been able to find these web pages and run the web server and stuff like that, if you haven't been able to edit the PY scripts in site idle, just watch. Just kick back. Don't stare at your phone, though. Just watch. Word doc knows all. So we need to change the code to say Ringo instead of Pete. So we need to use idle and find the voting.py file, which I have opened. Voting.py. And here's our list of beetles. I'm going to change Pete to Ringo. Now when we run it, come back here and go to, uh, you know, localhost 8080. We click on the voting page. The server, the Python server, generates a call to voting.py, which generates the web page. And it says John Paul George Ringo. Here he is. It's messing me up that these are not in the same order that you typically hear them rattled off. John Paul George Ringo. All right. So we did that by changing the Python script. Now it would probably hit a database to pull out this list rather than just have it hard coded. Now use idle to open vote selected and we're going to change the script a little bit. Here's what we want the script to look like. We're going to customize the results. Once we know the name of the beetle that we got, we're going to customize the uh, result. Maybe we'll just do it for like one or two of them. Right now it's just saying right on man, you know, love is all you need. That's a generic response. But let's go and customize it for a different name. So go and find the vote selected script. Notice it's pulling the name out of the button value, pulling it from the form data, and right here we're going to insert an, uh, an if statement right underneath print beetle plus name before write on man. So if name equals equals, quote, who do we feel like blessing today? Paul, colon, we're going to generate a different paragraph. A equals yate dot para, quote, the walrus was Paul. And this is all gobbledygook unless you happen to be a Beatles fan end quote, in parentheses, else colon, and then tab that over. So we can see what it's doing is if the data that we pulled from the form is equal to Paul, we're generating a new line, a different line of paragraph text, else we're setting it to that. And we could keep going. If name is equal to John, you know, whatever, strawberry fields forever, whatever the document suggests. Now, I don't need to run that, but I do need to save it so it's waiting 
for our web page to load it. So if I chose Paul and click select, it says the walrus is Paul because that was the paragraph text that we created. And what's the takeaway of this? Some of these things are just .html files, right? This index page, the very beginning, home, index.html, is just a simple HTML file. However, this link here doesn't call another HTML tag, which it usually would. Instead, it calls a voting.py. And since we have the, uh, the HTTP daemon, the server software running, it picks up the fact that it's running a PY script, doesn't try to display it inside the browser, and instead calls Python, which generates everything on this page. Nowhere does this web page exist. It's all generated by the Python file. Now that's server-side processing. This is what Amazon and eBay and all those other complicated web pages are doing when you start generating something. It uses templates to create extraordinarily powerful, excuse me, extraordinarily complicated web pages based on database pools, right? To pull in all the, uh, you know, the items for sale, to build a menu that's customized for you, right? Then, when they click this button and it calls submit, it generates post form, makes a post call, which is what it's supposed to do when it tries to load a new image upon a button click, and calls this Python file, vote selected. And again, the server picks up that it's uh, not an HTML file, but it's a Python file, and so it runs that script. This script generates yet another page. We have this web page being cranked out. That web page pulls some data out of it based on the form using CGI. It builds a new set of responses. We can customize its behavior based on the variables that we pull in, or we can make database, you know, database queries and build a web page as complex as we wanted to. And then finally, the template editor, include a footer. The home is supposed to take us to index.html. The vote is supposed to take us to voting.py again. And we could do cool stuff like, uh, you know, keep a tally. You remember back in the old days when people thought it was really cool to keep a counter of how many times their web page was accessed? Then you get depressed and you went there and it only had three accesses. All right. And so. Like yeah, yeah. All right. So if it. Pardon? Or they're all you. Right, right. So, if anybody was actually trying to type along with me, and I really wasn't expecting most of y'all to do it, I want to come and see if you got it changed. Realistically, this would be generated by something else other than Python. They would be running another scripting language, another language. Java is a common one for cranking out the text that generates a web page. C Sharp is another one. Facebook is very strange and just uses pure CGI unless they've shifted from that and they've had to customize their software incredibly to get CGI to scale up to the enormity of, of what Facebook handles every day. That this was a good enough taste of server-side programming. Right? What the server-side programming does is it hits databases, it generates HTML to send it. And that's a different idea because if you've done HTML like in Donna Wilson's class or something, I think what you're doing is you're building web pages, right? You're creating HTML files. And what we're doing in here instead is invoking a program that creates the uh, HTML page for us. Now what it's probably going to do is it's probably going to open an HTML file to use as a template and then, you know, start printing that out but at appropriate places put in the data we need because web pages need to be really pretty, right? And that prettiness is way too complex to just put a whole bunch of print statements in here. Like if we go to rose.edu, boy howdy is it a complex web page. So if we do uh, view page source, there would be an HTML file that has a majority of this stuff embedded in it. 
but I would bet to some fair degree that a lot of it is also generated programmatically, that it's reading the HTML file, the server is reading the HTML file, and invoking some kind of programming language to generate some of this HTML, and the whole thing would be sent via the uh, programming language that's tied in, that's being invoked by the server software. And I bet that some of y'all have worked in uh, server environments and know more about it than I do and could do a better job of explaining it. And if so, that's awesome. All right. You know, I would have liked to have spent, you know, two weeks on this stuff, three weeks on this stuff. But frankly, 